The argument that this collection participates in a paradigm shift is expressed clearly and repeatedly in both the book's introduction and in its abstract. If this shift is indeed happening in the humanities and arts, then it will be happening in the field of rhetoric, too. As such, this collection of essays stands to give us insight into our own shifting paradigms. But does it? Does this collection of essays, mostly coming from theater and performance scholars, really reveal a current paradigm shift? And if so, what can this book teach us about shifting trends in rhetoric? It is important to note that the term performance within this collection relates specifically to the act of performing a character. However, the book discusses this process of performing a character in several other very rhetorical ways. D.W. Zeidel, for example, describes performance as a temporary assuming of the other, as a process of symbolic interaction, as well as a process of symbolic self-transformation. Already, this idea of performance begins to sound pretty rhetorical. While most of the book is broken down into four parts, the first chapter, titled Consciousness and the Brain, A Window to the Mind, stands alone. Written by D.W. Zeidel, a neuroscientist and neuropathologist, this chapter frames the rest of the collection with a neurological perspective of consciousness and of theater. Zeidel describes performance as a complex process that requires highly functioning frontal lobes. She also explains that, unlike controlled speech, which is housed mostly on the left side of the brain, the process of performing is actually under the control of separate neurological pathways and localized neuronal processes. Overall, this chapter demonstrates that performing a character is a cognitively demanding and complex neurological process, thus establishing performance as a cognitively credible process. Even this first chapter provides useful insights for the field of rhetoric. For example, this chapter looks at the physical reality of the brain during performance, and as such accounts for the physical body during performance. Incorporating physical science into this collection gives it a very concrete level of embodiment. Many scholars in rhetoric discuss issues of embodiment. This collection is an example of how incorporating the knowledge of other disciplines, such as the physical and natural sciences, can help us to discuss the physical reality of bodies in our work. But perhaps the most useful thing this chapter has to offer rhetoric is the idea that engaging in movement and verbalization simultaneously may impact the brain more than engaging in verbalization alone. Following this first chapter, the remaining chapters are broken down into four sections. Part 1, Pedagogy of Performance Training. Part 2, Eastern Influences on Western Performance Training Technologies. Part 3, Reception and Reflection in Contemporary Performance. And Part 4, Theorizing the Consciousness of Postmodern Performance. Mom, <laughs> <laughs>